to the American Embassy in Berlin. Presenting a new radio series adapted from Mr. Miller's book, You Can't Do Business with Hitler, Episode 1. Heads, they win. Tails, we lose. This is Douglas Miller speaking. I'll be very blunt and to the point. I want to give you a picture of Nazi trade methods and Nazi business methods as I saw them during my 15 years in Berlin. I have two reasons for so doing. First, to tell you some of the causes of this war that you perhaps have never heard of before. Second, to convince you, if you need convincing, that there can never be any compromise with Hitlerism. We wipe it out, or it wipes us out. Now let's get on to cases. The case of James Dunning Forrester, for example. Forrester was an American businessman who, back in 1937, was trying to do business with Germany. He had nearly completed a deal to sell a shipload of American goods to the Nazis. To close the deal, Forrester was asked to call upon an important Nazi official at the Ministry of Economics in Berlin. And now, Herr Forrester, there are just a few things more to settle, and we conclude your business. But I thought everything was settled. Not quite everything, Herr Forrester. There is the matter of shipping. But my firm will take care of that naturally. Yeah, of course. But we expect that you will ship your goods on a German ship. I'm sorry, I'm afraid that's impossible. My company has a contract with an American line. You see, we... And the contract must be broken. I beg your pardon. Well, I, I mean, Herr Forrester, that our regulations demand that your goods be shipped on a German vessel. Otherwise, your business with us must be cancelled. But uh, why should I put American seamen out of a job? Regulations, Herr Forrester. Regulations. There's nothing I can do about it, you understand. Well, I, I suppose it could be arranged, but I don't like it very well. Now, another thing, Herr Forrester. Are you insured with an American company? You needn't worry about insurance, Herr Schwartz. The company I'm insured Is with... Is it an American company, Herr Forrester? Naturally. Mm. Unfortunate. I don't understand. Well, our regulations demand you insure with a German company. Why, that's ridiculous. After all, I'm the one who stands to lose if anything happens. I think I should have the right to insure myself with an insurance company of my own choosing. Herr Forrester, are you implying that German insurance companies are not dependable? I'm implying nothing of the kind. Look here, Herr Schwartz. We'll forget this insurance matter for the moment. But how many other regulations do I have to conform to? Well, when your cargo is loaded in America, it must be examined by German inspectors. German inspectors, eh? Well, that's all it was me. Your company, of course, must pay the expense of sending these inspectors from Germany to America and back again. Now, wait a minute. Why should we pay the expenses of men who are working in your interest? I never heard of such a thing. Herr Forrester, if you wish to do business with Germany, you must do it according to German regulation. No other country has such arbitrary regulations. The Great Reich, Herr Forrester, is not responsible for the regulations of other countries. That's some consolation. I beg your pardon. Uh, never mind. Let's get on with it. Then. And that's the way the Nazis do business. There's no such thing as having a purely business relation with a totalitarian state. Every business deal carries with it political, military, social, and propaganda implications. Proof? I have plenty of proof. For example, about three years ago, Gable's Ministry of Propaganda arranged for the president of the German film chamber to visit my office to discuss and exchange of motion pictures. After this high Nazi official had arrived and we had exchanged a few pleasantries, he said to me, Herr Miller, Dr. Goebbels is interested in buying American motion pictures. The few that we have shown have been very popular here. Yes, yes, of course. But am I to understand that the American film companies will be paid cash for these films? 
cash? Yeah, of course. What else? Well, isn't it a bit unusual? Uh, usually you do business on a barter basis. Yeah, but this is different. And will the American firms be able to take their profits out of Germany? That is, uh, without the usual restrictions, I mean? There will be no restrictions. Well, I'm very glad to hear it. But, uh... Why are you waiving a standard regulation? Ah, but we are very friendly to America. Oh, oh, I see. This is a gesture of goodwill. Really. Yeah, goodwill. That's it. So, of course, we would expect some little favor in exchange. Oh, I see. And uh, what is the nature of the favor? Well, Herr Goebbels would like each of the large motion picture theaters in 25 of your leading American cities to give one quarter of their time to us. You mean Air Gables would like to supply Americans with motion pictures in these cities? Yeah, that is, the Ministry of Propaganda would supply the pictures. Oh, but you don't understand. The United States government has no power to force American motion picture houses to show German propaganda films. <laughs> or any other films for that matter. The United States government hasn't the power... Oh, come, come, Herr Miller, you are joking, yeah? No, no, seriously. American movie houses show what films they choose to show. But I cannot believe it. It's according to an old American principle, freedom of speech. I have never heard of such a thing. Herr Miller, if you do not agree to our arrangement, Herr Goebbels will be very displeased. Yes, but if I do agree to such an arrangement, I'm afraid the American people will be very much displeased. And after all, they're the ones who would have to look at Air Gable's films. <laughs> so you see, the Nazis were very willing to do business with us if they could, in exchange, flood American theaters with their Nazi propaganda. Because American movie producers refused to agree to the Nazis' outrageous demands, the Nazis deliberately set out to ruin our movie business in Germany. Proof? Here you are. In 1932, we sold Germany almost three and a half million feet of film. In 1938, because of Nazi restrictions, we were sending to Germany less than a half a million feet of film per year. Anyone caring to check these figures will find them in the publication of the United States Department of Commerce entitled Foreign Commerce and Navigation. Send for it and see for yourself. Sometime after my experience in the film transaction, Air Gables approached another American official in Berlin. At that time, Germany was trying to gain the favor of American newspapers and radio stations. Here's what Air Gables said to our embassy official on that occasion. Sir... I am very pained at the insults offered to our leader in your American newspapers and your American radio broadcasts. I see no reason why we cannot have an understanding about such things. So what do you suggest? Oh, this is a friendly gesture. I suggest that you select any German journalist or radio announcer who, in your opinion, has made remarks insulting to the United States. I promise you that I will arrest the offending person within 24 hours. Furthermore, I shall see that he is punished in any way you see fit. Now, why can't we have the same friendly cooperation on the part of the American government? <laughs> Can you imagine our government permitting any foreign government to point out offending American journalists or radio broadcasters and suggesting their arrest? Yet Germany was treating us very well compared to the way she treated smaller countries who were powerless to resist. Let me tell you what happened to Swedish firms doing business with the Nazis. One day in the office of the president of one of these Swedish firms... Mr. President, this letter... Uh, never mind that now, Carlson. I called you in here to discuss something very important. But this letter is <laughs> urgent, Mr. President. You must look at it. Uh, right please, Carlson, listen to me. But, sir, Carlson, I want to talk to you about a personal matter. Now, will you please sit down here? Oh, very well, sir. Carlson, how long have you been working for me? How long? Let me see. 21 years? 21 years. <laughs> well... I don't have to tell you, Carlson, that you've been one of my most loyal employees. Is there something the matter, Mr. President? No, no, nothing. No. 
Well, have you thought of retiring, Carlson, on a, on a pension, I mean? Oh, Mr. President, is this all you have to speak of, my career? <laughs> no, sir. I have ten good years in me yet for the company. Now, this letter, Mr. President, you must look at it. It is from the Berlin Secret Police. The Gestapo? Yes. They demand that we stop advertising our goods in the local newspaper. What right have they to ask such a thing? The best newspaper. We've been advertising in it for years. You don't understand, Carlson. The paper in which we advertise is pro-democratic. And this is the Nazi method of striking out at their enemies. Well, they're using us as a tool. But we won't do it. You tell them, sir. You tell them we won't do it. I can't tell them that, Carlson. If, if I refuse, it means ruin. You must refuse. But you don't understand. We're, we're in their hands. We, we've come to depend upon their business. If they should cut it off now. Well, if only I hadn't permitted myself to be led into such a position. In one demand after another. I thought I could play along with them and still maintain our independence. I was wrong. Don't give in to them, sir. You must make a stand somewhere. No, no it's settled, Carlson. We make all necessary changes and see that our advertising contract is transferred elsewhere. Very well, Mr. President. If that's your order. Now, I'll go back to my office. Uh, Carlson, wait. Yes, sir? This other matter, your resignation. But I'm not ready to resign, Mr. President. Please, now, I'll be very frank with you. I received another letter from the German secret police that I haven't told you about. Another letter? Yes. Remember a few months ago, they, they asked me to send them a complete list of all the workers here? Well, they've checked that list with their spies here in Sweden, and now they demand that I discharge certain employees. Discharge employees? But why? Well, the Nazis say they are Jewish and communistic. Of course, that these are the names the Nazis apply to anyone opposed to fascism. Will discharge these employees? Then? I must. But I only I wanted you to understand. That's all, Mr. Preston. No. No, it's not all. One more thing. Yes? Carson, your your name was among those the Nazis demanded I discharge. My name? Yes, because you have openly stated your hatred of the Nazis. Now, of course, you understand you will be pensioned. You don't have to worry about your wife or your You children. needn't discharge me. I shall save you the trouble. Any man who would work here is a traitor to his country. I resign. Oh, don't go on like that, Carlson. You must understand my position. Carlson, wait. Carlson, please come back here. Carlson. I have given you, in the short time available, some faint idea of the viciousness of Nazi business methods. Germany has been carrying on a war against America since 1933. A war of trade, a war of espionage, a war of propaganda. We must finish this once and for all, so that Hitler's cutthroat business and propaganda methods will never again sap our strength. We must carry on this war until Nazism is completely and finally exterminated. You can't do business with Hitler. You have been listening to the first broadcast in a new radio series entitled, You Can't Do Business with Hitler. Listen for the second broadcast in this series, which is entitled, Broken Promises. This program, written and produced by Frank Talbert, is brought to you by the Office for Emergency Management in Washington. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.